Well, Hannah, I'm so excited to have you on the podcast. When you sent me your email, I like immediately sent it to Lauren and I was just like, yes, like this is such a good story. Um, I think that a lot of people can probably relate to your story and what you um, went through. And so, yeah, I'd love to just jump in and, and hear your story. So I was raised in the church, you know, like a super active family. And for the most part, it was really great in my childhood. I love the young women program. I love primary and everything. And it was really good. There were like some, a few things that like I'll get to kind of later when I'm talking about my story of just things that thoughts and stuff that I had or things I went through that made a lot more sense later in my life. I served a mission. I went to BYU. I got married in the temple. And in 2020, I had my first baby. You know, 2020 was a really crazy year I think for everybody with COVID and there was just like a lot of things going on with politics and on top of that I also was freshly postpartum I just kind of when my baby was about six months old I hit like a breaking point where I was just like I've got to talk to somebody I just felt so much turmoil in my mind and I was having a really hard time feeling confident in like any decision I made And so I went to a therapist and kind of talking about some of the things that were bothering me. And then from there, it kind of progressively got worse. And I eventually went to a treatment center. It was an outpatient treatment center. So I'd go every day and then, you know, come home after I would do therapy and stuff. And you said you were diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder. Yeah. So OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Once I went to treatment, I kind of got more specifics of like, what kind of OCD I have. There's a lot of different subtypes and I suffer from a couple of them, but the one that I mainly want to focus on is called scrupulosity. It's basically obsessions surrounding religion and morality, like moral and religious issues. Some of the things when people have scrupulosity that they might suffer with, and like me in particular, is like pathological guilt, obsessing over um, sins and like wondering if you're forgiven or feeling like you have to do everything completely perfect. Just to like make it clear, like this is not just an issue in the LDS church. It is across every religion. Like they see it in every religion and even people who aren't religious can have scrupulosity if they're obsessed with like making the right, wrong or right choice. Um, but I do think it is very prominent in the LDS religion. I live in Utah. So the treatment I went to was in Utah. So a lot of people were members of the church and just kind of relating on that front. These are some of the ways scrupulosity like presents itself in me. So I remember when I was um, a teenager, I would like do something wrong or mess up or sin and then just excessively repent, just excessively repent and never feel like I was forgiven ever. Or like feeling like I have to confess what I've done wrong to my parents or to the bishop over and over and over again. When I was really little, I even remember there was a period of time where I was terrified of going to jail. And like it made no sense. I was like six. But I was so afraid I was going to go to jail because I was so afraid that I was going to do something wrong. And my parents are like, well, just don't break the law. Like you're not going to go to jail. And I was so afraid of just messing up or doing something wrong or God being mad at me. And that's like been a theme that I've seen over and over in my life. And on my mission, it was, of course, um, bad, too, because there's so many rules. (laughs) I read my journal now and just I want to hug myself like you're doing the best you can. Like the atonement is there for a reason. That's one of the ways that scrupulosity has really affected me is just like the guilt and ruminating on past sins or just so feeling like I have to do things exactly right. You know, I think the church culture is not perfect, obviously. And in a way, it really perpetuates this black and white thinking that people will get stuck in. That it's like, like, I'm either bad or I'm good, right? Or everything is, you know, they say like, okay, if the Book of Mormon is true, then that means all the prophets have been real prophets, and which is true. But sometimes that, that can mess up your thinking when maybe you don't agree with something or there's something in church history that's difficult for you to understand. And you go, okay, well, if the church is true, then that means everything that a leader has ever done has to be a hundred percent true. 
And it's really hard to get out of this thinking of just black and white thinking. And I think the church can sometimes perpetuate that. Well, not the church, but more like the culture, you know, with that kind of way of thinking, it kind of my scrupulosity morphed from this feeling like I had to be perfect to more of like a faith crisis. And that's something that I still struggle with occasionally, like I'll be triggered by something and it like all comes back and I have to kind of take a step back and realize, okay, what do I really think? What do I really believe? But like, I'll be really plagued with the thought of what, what do I actually think is true? And do I hundred percent know? And, you know, like bearing my testimony is hard because I want to be truthful and I don't want to say, I know without a surety of the doubt, because I don't sometimes that was kind of where I was at. But when I went into treatment, is that how scrupulosity was affecting me? It was this like ongoing faith crisis that I just could not get over. Like I would pray and I would study and I would get an answer and it would make me feel better for like a day. And then it was just back to again. It's just a cycle. And that's really what OCD is. It's so it's obsessive compulsive disorder. So people who have OCD will have an obsession or like a thought or something like that. And then they feel that they need to perform a compulsion to make them feel better about that. So like most people think OCD is just you're really orderly or you wash your hands a lot and stuff like that. But that's just one type. And like, I don't even have that. A lot of people who have OCD don't don't even, they're not necessarily super clean or orderly. But, you know, with an example like that, a trigger could be maybe you touched a doorknob. And so now you're thinking, oh, no, like I have germs. And so then your compulsion would be to wash your hands five times. Mm -hmm. So this so the same thing can happen with anything. Right. And so with, you know, scrupulosity, the OCD surrounding religion, it might be I messed up and I sinned. I've got to pray for an hour now. But the thing with OCD is it doesn't matter how many times you do your compulsion, you never feel better. And so when it came to um, stuff surrounding faith crisis, I would maybe see something online or someone would say something. And then my compulsions would be, I have to figure out every single piece of information there is. And I've got to read every comment on this Instagram post, or I have to make sure I'm reading every book that someone is recommending that helped them or led them astray. And because I have to have all the information, I have to be a hundred percent to make a good choice. I have to know that a hundred percent without any doubt, but that's just not how life works. Like life is full of uncertainties and even within a gospel context, it's full of uncertainties. There's just things that we don't know whether that has to do with um, current policies or like church history. There's things we don't know and things that we'll never know. But that doesn't mean we have to throw away what we do know. So when I did my treatment, I did what's called exposure therapy. And so basically what exposure therapy is, is they will, you will expose yourself to a trigger and then try to not do your compulsion. So when it came to scrupulosity and my religious obsessions, I would expose myself to a trigger. So while I was in therapy, I would like maybe read anti-Mormon material, or I would like read a blog post about how the church has hurt somebody or how they've left the church and then try to not do my compulsion, which would be to basically ruminate on that all the time or ask the opinion of everyone in my life, what they think about that and try to get everyone's opinion of what I need to do moving forward. And so it was, I mean, as you can imagine, it was incredibly painful. It was super hard, but it was also like the best thing for my testimony just realizing that, well, first of all, you can't know everything. And even if you did know everything, you can't, you're going to have uncertainty in your life, but you can move forward with what you think is right. And you can move forward with that. And that can be enough. So with all of this, I remember at one point I was just, you know, I had been doing this treatment. The point of treatment wasn't necessarily for me to stay in the church or to leave the church. It was just for me to like, my therapist wasn't even LDS and it was just for me to not to get comfortable with uncertainty basically. Mm -hmm. Um, And I remember after treatment one day I got home and I was just, I mean, just so confused. I, I wasn't suicidal, but I did want to die because I just wanted this burden of 
me trying to make this decision of do I stay or do I leave to go away. And I remember I was just praying and writing in my journal. And I just kind of had this realization of agency and that we can choose to believe. And one of my very favorite scriptures is in, I think it's Alma 32, where it's talking about faith is like a seed. But basically, it just talks about how even if all you have is a desire to believe, let that work in you. I think people can relate to this, whether they have OCD or not, just that sometimes all you have is the desire to believe. You maybe have these like past experiences or this upbringing that um, was good. And then you're presented with other information about the church or about God or, or experiences that don't line up with that. You can take that piece of you from before and say, I desire to believe, I desire to be in this spot again. And that is enough. Like the scriptures tell us that is enough. You can take that and plant it and that can grow into mm-hmm. something more. And there's been so many times where I say, you know, okay, I just have a desire to believe, or I have a desire to feel peace about something and I can choose to move forward with that. And I can choose to believe. And then that takes hold and, you know, kind of almost fake it till you make it. And that's like been a huge thing that I've just learned throughout my treatment is just really understanding that we have agency for everything. And I remember you know, a couple of years ago before I was diagnosed with OCD, always saying, um, faith comes really hard to me. Like, it's really hard for me to just believe something. And like, I've realized that, that actually I have tremendous faith because not knowing something, but choosing to believe or choosing to go forward anyways, is like the biggest show of faith you can have. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole, that's the whole point of the veil is that we don't know that we don't have this hundred percent certainty that we were sent to this life with, um, the spirit as our companion and that can lead and guide us, but we don't know. We have to choose to believe. And that is truly what faith is all about. I think. I think you're so right. And also it's like when you're presented with information or a hard question about the church or, you know, like you have two choices. You can either seek, like you can choose to like turn to heavenly father for a, uh, an answer and kind of like to resolve that. Or you can like go down the path of like, I'm going to jump into this like hard thing and I'm going to make it even like dive into it and make it even like more right in your face and like how it's how it's putting a block between you and your testimony yeah and I think that if you turn to heavenly father and you you pray about it and you seek answers and you use your agency to seek that path it can actually become like a really cool experience for you to find answers in a spiritual way and something where you're when you encounter that information or whatever it can be like really dark and you're just like oh my gosh like what if it's all not true Mm -hmm. you know and then when you feel that way you can actually it can feel like that's like the end of the road or you're just like in total darkness but really that's can be just the beginning of like a whole lot of light and answers in your life yeah and I mean, with that, something, I feel like Satan can counterfeit mostly any feeling, um, happiness or joy, like that can come from things that aren't true. But the one thing that I don't think he can counterfeit is peace. That was something that I learned with my treatment as well, just because, you know, like I would be presented with this information and I'm thinking, okay, logically this makes sense, but like I I just feel turmoil inside. Like I don't feel peace. And then finally feeling like I do feel peace about making the decision to stay in the church or whatever decision I'm making. When I feel that peace, I know, okay, this is from God because I think, I don't think Satan can counterfeit peace. Like I just think that's the one emotion that belongs solely to God and, and Christ and, 
um, just that true peace. And that's something that I just have to remind myself over and over again, because, you know, I, I went through this treatment and I'm so much better. I'm doing so much better, but it doesn't, I still have OCD and I will always have it. So mm -hmm. I'm still faced with triggers all the time and things that will upset me and I might spiral for a day. But it's like I'm presented with this choice over and over again. And I keep going back to making the same decision, which is, okay, I don't know A, B, and C, but I have had these experiences that I know are real and true and fruits of the spirit and this peace that I have. And so I feel like I have to keep coming back and making this decision over and over again. I'm always making the same decision. And I, I feel peace about that. And I feel good about that. Um and when I do feel that turmoil or that darkness, kind of like what you were talking about, it doesn't last for long if I am able to call upon God and turn to what I believe, what I choose to believe is a source of light and goodness, which is the gospel and Christ and the scriptures. And so I never ended up actually leaving the church, but I've come close several times over the past decade and just kind of always like teetering on the edge. And, you know, like at this time when, when I am in a dark place, I've, I mean, I've probably read every, I've read the letter to my wife. I've read the CES letter. Like I've, I've seen all the things and it again, go back to that. I have that compulsion or that need that I'm like, I have to see and know and understand every little thing. Decision. What is the letter to my wife? I've never heard of that before. It's this guy that basically wrote a letter to his wife of all the reasons why he decided to leave the church. Mm. I mean, it's very similar to the CES letter. It's the same kind of, you know, reasons, mm -hmm. um, but it talks about church history and uh, like book of Mormon evidence and whether or not that exists. I really, I feel a lot of empathy and understanding for people who leave the church because it's such, I mean, our agency the first and one of the greatest gifts that besides the atonement that God has given us is our agency and our decision to choose. And, you know, I think we all are going to be presented with this choice over and over again in our life. And very easily I could have made a different choice. And so I really empathize with people that do make a different choice because, and I honor that because that is, I mean, that's God's plan is that we get to choose and we have that agency and we can choose, you know, if we're going to leave or if we're going to stay and if we're going to believe or if we're not going to mm -hmm. until after this life, we're not going to know everything a hundred percent, but you know, we can in good faith, I'm going to choose to move forward with this, even if I don't have every piece of information. And there's something so gratifying about choosing. Like I was talking to my sister-in-law last week and we were talking about that how to like we're not just like blind faith like you know going to church every sunday and like participating in these callings and stuff like this like we choose to participate and give of our time and give of our talents and to wear our garments and to like we are actively choosing to do that because we it brings peace and joy to our lives and like I see all kinds of people close to me and on social media that are leaving the church. And it's like, I feel like I am so grateful to have these things that provide like so much depth to my life and have answers. And like, I choose to wear my garments and I choose to do that because I love God. And I want to like, especially when it's hard you know, making that decision is really something that will fill your soul. And it's not like we're just doing it out of blind, like following this group of people that we were raised to follow. Like yeah. it is a choice. And I love how you're talking about agency and like, like it was the fruits of the spirit, like how, like you can see the fruits of the spirit. I can see that when I am doing these things that are good, I feel good. And I can see that, you know, very clearly people who are, you know, strong in the gospel, I can like, I see how their life is and I, you know, want that in my life. And so I don't know, I love that point about agency and just choosing to 
take that path. And I'm curious to know, like when you get into a spiral, like how is it that you're able to get yourself out? So again, with OCD, it's you'll have an obsession or a trigger and then you want to perform these compulsions. So, I mean, through talking with a therapist and also just coming to understand the disorder, I now know what my compulsions are. So the biggest thing is like, do not do your compulsion, which is so hard because when you have OCD, your mind is telling you, okay, like just do it one more time and then you're going to feel better. Like just, just go and read the comments to this one thing and you need to get all the information you can and then you're going to feel better. Mm -hmm. And so the biggest thing is to just stop yourself from doing the thing that ultimately, you know, is toxic in your life. And so when I was getting sober and it's like, just one more time, it's going to help. It's going to make you feel better. Yeah. Like you're finally going to feel better. And you know, like some people that I met in treatment and I've gotten to know, um, their compulsions and like their scrupulosity might look different. So it might be like, like I was saying, Oh, I messed up. Now I need to pray for an hour or I just need to read my scriptures. Like so perfectly um this whole week and then i'll feel better and sometimes if when you have ocd i'm not advocating that you don't read your scriptures but some people if they have ocd the thing that they need to do is maybe to not read their scriptures because they need to break that cycle that just keeps happening and happening and happening and like really what it's come down to i realized when i was obsessing over like a past sin or something like that I mean, I had the atonement all wrong. I was not relying on the savior at all. I was thinking I could save myself. I was thinking I could atone for myself if I just punish myself enough, if I just confess enough, if I feel as much guilt as possible, like that I can save myself. But in reality, like that's the complete opposite. The savior already suffered for our sins. And so when we repent and when we, you know, confess to Heavenly Father and then we try to be better like we need to let that go because it's a mockery of the atonement if we're not right. i think there's a lot of ways to make a mockery of the atonement one might be choosing to sin and being like oh i'll repent later but it can be the other extreme too where it's just like you do not accept the grace right. from the savior just a couple of months ago i was kind of i had a day where i was spiraling it was someone that i love very much announced that they l- left the church and um just I, you know it immediately puts me where oh i don't feel confident with my decisions like am i supposed to be doing that and i was kind of just having a bad day and i was at a family function we were like it was in october we were carving um pumpkins <laughs> and my parents were there and some other family and i was talking to my dad about it and i just started crying and was just crying so hard and one of those times where you just can't get a hold of yourself you just can't mm-hmm. stop And I went into the bathroom at my brother's house and I was trying to like calm myself down. And I just said a prayer and I remember just praying and saying like, I feel so misunderstood like with this um, disorder. And I just feel like nobody understands, like trying to tell my dad and he's trying to empathize, but he doesn't understand and nobody understands. And just like, please give me this peace. And I finally get a hold of myself and I, you know, I'm still feeling pretty bad on the inside. And I go out there and I start carving pumpkins. And my oldest, he was two at the time. And just randomly out of the blue, he just turns to me and he's like, mom, God helps the people. And and he says, look at my hands. And I said, oh, God said that? He said, no, Jesus. Jesus says, look at my hands. And it was just, I mean, you know, he's only two years old. And it was just this wow. beautiful moment of like this reminder from my child of, someone does understand you and it's Jesus and someone does understand and wants to help you. And it's Jesus. And he, he paid the price for your sins and for all the heartaches and all the pain you're going to feel in life, including mental disease that I have that, um, where I feel like nobody does understand, but he does. And it was just such a special moment. I I'm sure you've maybe experienced that as well, but to be taught by your children, Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, wow, you know, two years old and the spirit prompted him and is using him to teach me. And it was was like a really special moment. And um, those things happen over and over again when I spiral. Like there's always just 
I'll put one foot forward and I'll say, okay, I'm super confused, but I'm still going to choose to pray. And I'm still going to choose to talk to you about this. And Heavenly Father, through the Spirit, just reminds me over and over again, like, hey, you're doing the best you can. You're doing the right thing. Just keep moving forward. Someday it's going to make sense. Someday your questions are going to be answered. And it might be in the next life. But don't throw away what you do know to be true or these positive experiences just because there are some things that do not make any sense to you and that you need reass- constant reassurance with. Yes. I love that so much. What a beautiful testimony of choosing to believe and choosing to have faith. I think that so many times it's like when people leaving the church is just so loud and, you know, oh. it can be like distracting for for those that choose to stay. And it's like it can be it can cause like a a faith wobble <laughs> as mm-hmm. from, from one of our previous episodes. Called. Yeah but we always have our agency and we always have that choice to move forward. And I just love that you brought that up. And I mean, that story about, you know, having your child teach you is so beautiful. Yeah. So amazing. It's so cool when we have those experiences where we know that God is so aware of us. Yeah. And I truly think that, you know, we're given trials and stuff to make us better and to strengthen our faith, make us more empathetic and loving people towards others. And I I have a private Instagram account, but I posted, you know, that I had OCD. I mean, that's probably close to two years ago. And I just can't believe how many people have reached out and been like, oh, I've been diagnosed with that too. And just, and that's why I really wanted to share this is um, it's really vulnerable and it's kind of embarrassing. But um, like I was saying before, I do think that it, prevalent in the church. Um, people have, you know, it's more than just a faith crisis. It's maybe like an obsession that there's help for that. Yeah. And, you know, there's some people I've met who have chosen to leave the church because of their OCD, because they felt like that was going to give them peace. But again, it always comes to that choice. You can choose what you're going to do. Um, and you can choose to stay and, I've been tremendously blessed for it. Honestly, like I, I don't regret my decisions at all. Um, and there have been times, you know, when I am spiraling or I'm going through, you know, kind of a OCD phase where you really question every decision you've ever made and don't have a lot of confidence, but I can look at my life and see the blessings that I have. You know, I have beautiful family and I have a really good marriage. And I know that the good decisions I made in my life led to that. Mm -hmm. Um, So I don't want to throw that away or I don't want to give, I don't want to deprive my children of those certain blessings that I have in my life because I was raised in the church. Um, Just because I maybe am confused about some things or don't understand. Mm -hmm. And I want to say something really quick about your comment about being embarrassed. Like this is 1000% a safe space. Like almost everybody that's been on the podcast has shared something that could potentially feel embarrassing for the whole world here. But the thing that I have realized is that every time somebody comes on the podcast and shares their story, we get so many messages that are like, oh my gosh, that was just for me. That's exactly what I needed to hear. And so I think that the really cool thing is that this really challenging experience that you went through, you know, somebody's going to hear this and it's going to be exactly what they need to hear. Um, and it will be an answer to their prayers. So, you know, just thank you so much for coming on the podcast and for emailing me and being willing to be so open about your story with the whole world. You're welcome. (laughs) Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being a supporter of the Comeback Podcast and listening to our episodes. It would mean so much to us if you would like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. It helps other people be able to find us and we want to share this message to everyone.